Today, we're diving deep on the Broncos quarterback situation. We'll analyze the jobs on the depth chart that are there for the taking. And with the Bears on the schedule this week for preseason game one, we'll break down the key matchups to watch. You are listening to the Huddle Up Podcast. Welcome to the Huddle Up Podcast, your go-to show for all things Broncos. Welcome in to the Huddle Up Podcast presented by Mile High Huddle. It's time to drop some knowledge. I'm your host, Chad Jensen, Scout Media, CBS Sports Digital. Will Keyes, my uh, co-host here, is out today. He's on vacation. So I'm joined by two fellas you all know very well, Carl Dummler and Nick Kendall. Fellas, what's good? Terrell Davis, officially a Hall of Famer. It's surreal, isn't it? Yeah, I, I listened to his whole Hall of Fame speech, and I'll, I'll be honest, I was tearing up, and I was cheering when he was talking about uh, Pat Bowen and his, uh, you know, the, this next year that he should get in. Oh man, it was it was beautiful to see Terrell Davis, my favorite Bronco of all time. So great to see him in. Nick, did you uh, did you check out Terrell Davis's speech at the Hall and watch him actually put on the jacket for the first time? Oh, absolutely. I was following it. I was also following this week's Hall of Fame pretty closely because I have a family tie with Kurt Warner. My dad grew up working with his sister-in-law, and I also played, you know, sports with a few of his nieces and nephews growing up. So always saw Kurt Warner, you know, three or four times, you know, whether it be at B-dubs or a sporting event and got to meet with him. And I've always been a fan of him. So it was a it was a good Hall of Fame weekend for sure. That's cool. One of the most unique stories. Um I think in NFL history and Hall of Fame history, how Kurt Warner made it to to uh, enshrinement. That's pretty cool. Well, today's episode is brought to you by Audible. Get a free audiobook download and a 30-day free trial at audibletrial.com forward slash huddle up. There's over 180,000 different titles to choose from when you get your free book for your trial for your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or MP3 player audibletrial.com forward slash huddle up. This is something that I use on a daily basis. I don't always have time to sit down and turn the pages on the books that I want to read. But while I'm doing other things, whether it's my commute or things around the house or whatever, exercising, I can turn on the book and get through it. Carl's a big fan. Nick's become a proponent. So take a second and support the show as well. It's very important to us continuing to bring you these episodes each and every week. Uh, Patronize our sponsors. Show them some love. Go to audibletrial.com forward slash huddle up. Give that 30-day free trial a, a roll. Remember, you get a free book, and if you don't like it, you can cancel. Now, we are here to give you a deep dive on your favorite team, the Denver Broncos, and we need your help. We can't grow without you. So make sure you take a second to rate and comment on the show, whether you're an iTunes listener, whether you use Stitcher or any of the other services the show is on. Very important to us growing the show, and really it's about reaching new listeners. Follow the show on Twitter at HuddleUpPod and make sure you're also following at Mile High Huddle because Broncos football is back in full spring uh, swing. Hold on. Because Broncos football is back in full swing. We've got preseason games coming down the pike this week, and you guys know we're going to be dropping knowledge on every tidbit of buzz that comes out of the games, that comes out of Dove Valley, and you're not going to want to miss a single episode. Now, before we get to quarterback watch, which is what I wanted to lead with today, I want to welcome in Mile High Huddle Analyst Colby Valdez. We were able to get Colby a credential to attend training camp as media on Friday, which isn't easy, I might add. The team is not too keen on credentialing a digital media. It's our cross to bear. But during camp, you know, they'll, they'll usually let a few of us in if we ask nicely, and we were able to get Colby in there. And, of course, we're grateful for the opportunity. But, Colby, man, welcome to the show. How was your experience covering Broncos camp as media on Friday? Hi, fellas. Uh, Just wanted to say thanks for having me on. It was a fantastic opportunity. I can't thank Mile High Huddle, you, Chad, and Eric Schubert, I believe his name is, enough for it. Absolutely. Yeah, it's. uh, we appreciate any opportunity they'll give us to get inside the building. Um, Let's start the show off with quarterback watch because 
It's what's on everybody's mind in Broncos country right now. Many in the media have already christened uh, Trevor Simeon the victor in the quarterback competition based on the last two days of training camp, including the scrimmage. Paxton Lynch, after a couple of good practices to start out camp, has been plagued by turnovers, which is usually a harbinger of one uh, a quarterback destined for the backup job. But the question we have to ask is why is Lynch turning the ball over significantly more often than, than Simeon at this point? And I think there's two reasons. One, Simeon has been, you know, we got to keep in mind, Simeon's been far from perfect himself. He's, he's last year as a starter, he had 21 dropped interceptions, uh, and he's had many picks dropped already early on in camp. Lynch just hasn't been as lucky. Two, a little birdie told me something that gives us a lot better insight on this is, uh, issue. Mike McCoy and Bill Musgrave have told both quarterbacks, from what we've heard, to be more aggressive with the football during camp. They want to see what they can get away with uh, on the on the Broncos' defense, which is arguably the best in the NFL. And the logic is they can establish what the limits are versus the no-fly zone. Then they're ha- they'll have a much better idea of what they can get away with versus uh, outside competition. But Simeon isn't aggressive by nature. We've seen that. He's more of a game manager. Bless his heart. You know, we love him for it. He's smart with the ball, and that's great. He hasn't tried to push it downfield as much as Lynch has, though. That's the truth. Lynch is more of the gunslinger type at heart. He's tried to take more chances during camp while the stakes are lower. So, fellas, as we evaluate these two quarterbacks leading up to the first preseason game, which is versus Chicago this coming Thursday, we have to do so through that prism, I think. And still, I have a hard time seeing the coaches choosing to roll out anybody Thursday night as this QB1 other than Trevor Simeon. But uh, let's let's start this off with Colby. What say you as, as far as the quarterback competition, what we've heard, what you've seen while you were there? Well, a coach's job is to win the next game, right? And right now the quarterback that has better grasp in the offense just based on the practice that I've seen and heard is Trevor Simeon. We've seen flashes of last year uh, when, pra- when uh, Paxton Lynch was – pretty dynamic in preseason but we also saw those turnovers as well but currently as we've seen the playbook open up it's been trevor simeon that has slowly grasped the opportunity in camp as far as winning the starting job i just think consistency putting a few games together how a few series even a few practices at this point would solidify either quarterback's role yeah it does seem like carl that Simeon just seems to have, I mean, we can talk about the different things going on, what these quarterbacks are are being told to do by the coaches, but it just seems at this point that Simeon has a little bit better grasp or command of the offense. He's always been known for for his mind with football. That that was one great thing that he had and why Kubiak loved him a lot. You know, Elway fell in love with the arm of Lynch, but Kubiak fell in love with the mind of of Simeon. And I, you know, I think that because they they saw each other in each other, you know, that, that's what a lot of people talk about is Kubiak saw himself in Simeon. And and I think that's that's very true. You know, he does a great job trying to protect the football, but it's sometimes, you know, maybe a little bit too much, I would say. Uh, like you said, we, we could talk about maybe what they're being asked to do. And, and the coach is actually being more upset about a completion for five yards compared to an interception 20 yards down the field. That's that's something that sometimes the media miss out on and sometimes what fans miss out on is there's a lot of things going on at these practices that we don't know. Right. There, there's times where they are asked to throw into double coverage in the middle of the field and see what they can do. And so, yeah, I, I do think Simeon was always going to be the guy that probably had a better grasp on the, on the playbook. And, you know, Lynch was always going to be that guy that his athleticism was going to help him to to win the the competition. So I do think practices set up a lot better for Simeon. Games could really set up better for Lynch. Would you agree with that take, Nick? Yeah, that makes sense to me. Simeon had the experience last year, you know, starting all those games compared to Lynch. And with the checks at the line of scrimmage, it's just something that I believe Simeon's more comfortable with right now. And as Elway just recently stated, you know, the the practice, the, quarterback race doesn't even really begin until the preseason games. He just said that uh, according to Mike Kliss uh, recently. So there's still a long way to go for this quarterback battle. And if Simeon is slightly in lead, the lead right now, it's, it's far from over. Here's another thing that might surprise some of our listeners. You know, it's one thing to have uh, for, as a quarterback to have to practice rep after rep against the no fly zone two all pros pro bowlers. It's a monumental task in and of itself. But how much harder do you think it would be 
if the defense actually knew what the play call was before the ball was snapped. Colby, you're the one that brought this to my attention. Tell us about what you learned on this issue when you were at camp on Friday, and of course, any insight as to why the coaches do it this way. They try to pack as much as they can on these quarterbacks. I mean, not much more you can ask for to go up against than, you know, two all pros and another all pro coming off the edge in Von Miller. But when you ask two young quarterbacks like these to go against that kind of guy, and then you add on top of the fact that the defense literally knows the routes coming, the cadence coming, it's a tall task. And what was funny was on Friday, let's see, who was it? It was uh, Trevor Simeon. He hit a guy in the, on a slant pattern, and I believe it was Marcus Robertson, the DB coach, that literally just laid into his DB. It, it obviously wasn't a no-fly zone member, but it was definitely a, a younger guy. Right. But uh, he laid into him, and he literally called out the entire offensive play. And he's like, you should know this. <laughs> Which was astonishing. And, of course, everyone looked at Brandon Stokely, who was as close as possible, and they're like, do they know these kind of things? And he just nodded, yeah, they know ahead of time. I can't fathom that. Nick, I'll start with you on this one. What do you think that the logic is on in, in the, the quarterbacks going against a defense during practice, granted, who knows what the play is before the ball is snapped? Well, it puts extra pressure on the quarterback to diagnose the defense before the ball is snapped and make the proper checks at the line of scrimmage. Something that McCoy has been known for, whether it be you know some influence from Peyton Manning, but he, since he's been with Peyton and even with Phillip Rivers and the Chargers, at the line of scrimmage checks have been super important in his offense. So with the defense knowing the play that's coming in from the offense, it just adds that extra sp- extra stress on the quarterback to get to the line of scrimmage, see if they can read where a blitz is coming from or the type of coverage, make a different play, you know, audible into a different run or a different pass and then go from there. So with them knowing that the, the offensive play call beforehand, it just means it gives them extra reason to audible into something else. Kind of helps us understand Carl, why these quarterbacks, neither of whom really uh, through nine practices have looked all that great. When you add in, as we've already talked about here, the no-fly zone, Von Miller, the pass rush, yeah, uh, th- that's enough pressure in itself. And so, yeah, pe- people need to have a little bit more understanding that there was going to be struggle. When you add in, especially, yeah, the the play calls already being known, it's an impossible task, but it's also one that I think can really push the quarterbacks to really notice the small things. And and that's that's good when the actual games kick in. And I think that's why... As, as Nick said, John Elway commented that the real competition begins preseason game number one, time where the defense finally doesn't know what they're doing and the, co- and the quarterbacks can really go out there and, and really show something. Absolutely. It just, I mean, it just, you can see how this type of an approach can really hone these quarterbacks to a razor's edge, either that or totally break them down. And Colby, as someone who's attended and scrutinized multiple practices during this year's camp, you have the closest look at these quarterbacks amongst those of us here on the show right now. And we can talk about how McCoy and Bill Musgrave have coached up the quarterbacks on being more aggressive. We can talk about the defense, knowing the play calls, but both guys still have to find a way to execute in those conditions. Now, while I would go so far as to say that Simeon's probably going to start the preseason, the first preseason game as QB1, I don't think that means he has the job in the bag, as, as Carl alluded to here a few minutes ago. Give us your take on who's in the lead as far as the quarterback competition and why. And in your mind, what has to happen between now and September 11th for the Broncos to really feel confident in naming their regular season starter? What's interesting about that whole, uh, you know, knowing the plays ahead of time thing is they're asking both quarterbacks to change and, you know, either audible or adjust their play at the line. And we've seen that from both, actually. We've seen Paxton Lynch, you know, take off and run instead of, you know, holding on to the ball a little bit too long, diagnosing the play and, you know, throwing the ball. And with Trevor Simeon, we've seen him diagnose the play in a Trevor Simeon type of way. Check the ball down, take what you can get. Probably not for a first down, but as far as I know, it's, it's rough for Trevor, (laughs) 
but as far as winning the job, it's it's really just gaining what you can gain and gaining consistency in preseason. They someone has to string together some something at this point. Who do you think that's going to be, Carl? In your mind, I mean, the preseason games start, of course, on Thursday in the Windy City. Uh, again, I think Simeon's going to probably be the first quarterback they trot out, but Lynch is going to get plenty of reps. It'll be basically, I would imagine it'll be a 50-50 type thing in game one with Kyle Sloter probably getting very few reps, may, maybe late in the game. But who do you think is going to start showing some some separation in this competition as we start marching into the actual preseason games that count much more against how these coaches make their evaluation? I still think it's going to end up being Paxton Lynch. I've talked to a, to a few people that are, are pretty connected to the team that still say Paxton is doing what the coaches want. Simeon isn't. And, and I know that's been hard for a lot of people and I, I've had a lot of pushback on that. And I know other people from my high huddle have had the same thing, yeah. but, and, and this is again, where we come back to this is a five is a five yard completion on third and eight as good as an interception down the field, where at least they're trying for a first down. Yeah. And, and that's tough for a lot of people to understand. All they see is interception. And for the coaches, they're sitting there saying, this quarterback did exactly what we asked them to do. And so I, I don't know. I, I think Paxson has done that, and I think it's going to show up better in games. Like I said, when, when the defense doesn't know the play calls, when he can really show off his athleticism, you know, when he can actually take off and make a defense have to respect that run game, Oh my goodness. I think that's going to really open things up for him. You know, defenses are going to have to play one on one on the outside if they, they want to keep somebody in to spy him, you know, or they're going to have to really push to try to keep him, you know, contained in the pocket. That means your, your outside guys on, on the defensive line, you know, they have to play that contained game. That means they can't just go straight for the quarterback Mm -hmm. like we saw a lot last year. So I think when, when that starts showing up, you know, that for me, I think if I was Paxton, I would take off my first pass attempt take off running, you know, and just make them see <laughs> this is going to happen, you know, <laughs> so you got to respect it. And so, yeah, I think especially this first preseason game, that's going to be where you're maybe going to see all that's been paying off of him taking some chances in practice that look like a ton of interceptions, which it, they are, and he needs to work on that. Yeah. But at the same time, I think that could really benefit him of knowing what doesn't work and what he can really do in an actual game. Colby, you might know the answer to this better, having been at a few of these practices, and especially that Friday practice from the inside. But, Nick, I want to ask you this. How much or do you think Paxton Lynch is being coached to not run during training camp and to execute from the pocket? I think that it is part of his game. As Vance Joseph has been saying, you know, it's just Paxton being Paxton. They want him to go through his progressions and his reads, but they also don't want him to be a quarterback that, you know, he doesn't have the skill set of. So they're going to let him run when it feels natural to him. But I'm guessing right now they're pushing him more to go through the progressions instead of just taking off because it's not only just about taking off. If you have those legs, it's about, you know, getting outside the pocket and buying time and resetting your feet and looking downfield, something that Russell Wilson has made famous. Well, not made famous, but, you know, really made a, an impact on the league with. So I think, you know, you got to let Paxton be Paxton. You got to let Trevor be Trevor and, Whichever guy wins, you got to utilize them the best way they can so that way they can continue to grow as a quarterback. Colby, before we uh, cut you loose, and again, thanks for joining us, brother, but before we cut you loose, you were at the scrimmage. And again, the scrimmage, we talked about this on Mile High Huddle all week. You know, this was the first big litmus test, really, for uh, these young players that are trying to make an impression on the coaches. And you were there. Aside from the quarterbacks watching the scrimmage, what were some of your big takeaways uh, from what you saw that day? Isaiah McKenzie. I can't speak to this guy's athleticism and quickness and speed more than I already have. The dude was everywhere. He was on special teams. He was on punt coverage. He was punt return. He was working with Sloter. He was working with Trevor and Paxson, whatever first or second team you want to label him. He was the dump off. He was running nines. He was running comebacks. He was going over the middle. The guy was everywhere. I mean, this guy's not only on the team for a punt, punt returner, but he's definitely here to stay. Not only that, but I've seen big holes being opened up by and- Andy Janovich. What's funny is he's being split out to start every play and then moved back in. Mm. It's almost like they're afraid to you know, move uh, 
it's almost like they're afraid to move Sanders around just to see, you know, if they're in man or whatever. Right. But once they get into their smash mouth football, the guy is opening up giant holes. Well, we could certainly use that. Absolutely. I mean, Andy Janovich, after he suffered that, uh, I believe it was an ankle that was the final uh, curtain call in his rookie season. That's when a fair to middling Broncos running game really just went down the tank. So uh, here's to hoping that he can continue that in the preseason, of course, into the regular season. But Colby, thanks for joining us, brother. You've done a great job for Mile High Huddle. You've only been with us, uh, what, a month or two. So keep up the good, uh, good work and we'll talk soon. All right. Always good talking to Colby. Now, we're going to preview game one of the preseason against the Bears here in just a minute. But before we do, let me holler at you about being a Mile High Huddle VIP. Now, many of you listeners have pulled the trigger on premium. We appreciate you. Supports the show, supports the site, allows us to continue to bring you what we believe is the most in-depth Broncos coverage on the web. So what is premium? What does it mean to be a VIP? Well, every week, Mile High Huddle saves our most analytical content for our VIPs, whether it's something a little more long form or a film review, some X's and O's. Uh, The news stories, uh, they're always going to be free to to everybody, but the in-depth analysis and any insider information we pick up along the way will be reserved for our VIPs. And here's how it works. You have two options. You can sign up for a monthly membership, which costs five bucks per month, or you can go annual, which costs 49 for the year. So going annual, in other words, you save 11 bucks uh, for the year. From there, you get access to all our premium content, including our members-only message boards, and you get 20%. Now, it used to be 10%, but when we moved over to CBS, they cut a new deal. You now get 20% off on all Broncos team merchandise and even your favorite collegiate teams through Fanatics. So the best way to support Mile High Huddle and also Huddle Up is to go premium. Go to milehighhuddle.com, click the Join button at the top menu on the right, and sign up. We love you. We appreciate you. All right. With the first preseason game coming this week, let's go through and spotlight the jobs uh, that are up for grabs. We've already deep-dived on the quarterbacks, talking to Colby, uh, but let's keep it on the offensive side of the ball to start. Max Garcia, it seems to me, is still in a dogfight uh, for his starting job at left guard. Alan Barber has been every bit the tenured veteran that you'd expect and has really put pressure on Garcia. But up to this point, even though the coaches have given Barber some first-team reps, they stuck with Garcia as the first-team left guard for the actual scrimmage, which is telling. It's not always what they say, it's what they do, and that's what they did. Nick, Carl, let's talk about this battle uh, and with the upcoming preseason game, how you foresee it shaking out. And Carl, we'll start with you. How do you see this battle shaping up? I have Alan Barber winning this thing. There, there, there's a couple reasons for this. One, obviously Garcia has struggled, and, and they wouldn't be bringing Alan Barber in unless Max Garcia was, was struggling this much. I know they said, I think even Elway said, that Max Garcia at the right guard, he was really having a tough time. And that's why they had to make the switch with him and, and Leary. So Alan Barber coming in now, since Garcia has been struggling here at left guard, I think puts a lot of pressure on Garcia. And, and I know he's performed a little bit better since Barber got to town. But still having that veteran in there, I think, is is a great thing to have. You have Garrett Bowles. He, he's going to win that left tackle job. We all know that. And do you really want a guy that's still trying to learn the position starting next to a rookie and being the blindside protectors of your quarterback? I, I don't think so. I think coaches, I think players would feel a lot better if there was a veteran next to him. Great point. And Alan Barber, to me, I think he's he's going to be the guy that wins this thing. Yeah, I'm waiting to see how it plays out on tape, uh, just based on preseason. Right now it seems like Garcia has the lead, but that could change rather rapidly depending on – you know how preseason goes. Uh, Barber is bringing abroad along more slowly just because he doesn't have the experience in the system that Garcia has right now. Uh, but I wouldn't be surprised if by the end of camp, Barber ends up winning the position because Garcia just hasn't taken that step that we've been waiting for. But I'm also not sleeping on McGovern or potentially Turner as well. You know, yeah. we do have some depth at that guard position right now that we haven't had in the years past. And if any of those guys are uninspiring or McGovern continues to shine, he's shined at center. He shined at right guard. Maybe he'll shine at left guard. So there's a lot of preseason left to go and we have a decent amount of bodies at the interior offensive line. So I'm excited for that and we'll, we'll see where it falls. You know, for what it's worth, my impression has been that the Broncos, uh, 
you know, they brought in Barber as the failsafe, and they they're not, you know, they keep giving rope to Garcia because he's the draft pick, he's the homegrown guy. But it just feels like as more time goes on, the less uh, the less confident Garcia is in that position. And as you say, Nick, you know, we got to wait to see what the tape tells us in these preseason games, but. He's definitely feeling the pressure. Now, we could talk about left tackle, but as you iterated there, uh, Carl, Garrett Bowles has this job in the bag, barring something catastrophic. So let's talk about the running backs. Instead, we know that C.J. Anderson is going to be the starter, uh, and the plan is for Jamal Charles to split reps with him. But when Devontae Booker injured his wrist, it really opened things up at the bottom of the depth chart. Guys like the rookie sixth-rounder, D'Angelo Henderson and the recently signed Stephen Ridley have been making some hay while the sun is shining. Nick, how many running backs do you think the Broncos are going to carry, knowing that Booker's coming back? So out of camp, how many do you think they're going to roster? And who do you see at this point as the guys who will fill out that depth chart? Right now, if I was the betting man, C.J. Anderson will obviously make the team. D'Angelo Henderson will obviously make the team. Jamal Charles will make the team. And Booker will make the team. However, they may stash him on Pup depending on how the guys behind those guys do. Uh, Jawan Thompson's apparently been having a solid camp. Janovich is not not making the team, you know, whether it be special teams, blocking as a, re- as a receiver. You know, he's just – he's a weapon, and they love him, and he embodies, you know, what they want of the more physical offense. So he's not, not going to make the team. So we'll have to see with Ridley. You know, I kind of still have a sour taste in my mouth during his tenures with not only the Patriots, but the Jets and everywhere else. He's just never been a guy who's – enough explosion or being a difference maker whether it be his issues with fumbling or just being kind of meh you know maybe he is fully recovered but still I I want to see it in the preseason games and I do not think Bernard Pierce is making this team either way he's been dealing with a hamstring issue I believe but so far I would have to guess Charles will make the team because he's just a dynamic playmaker Uh, Henderson will make the team Booker will make the team due to them being young and recent draft picks and Anderson obviously Carl how do you see this thing shaping up I asked, actually asked somebody a question about this of do do they see the possibility that the, Bar- the Broncos could maybe trade one of these running backs that maybe they have such great depth you know beyond what they even thought they did that maybe one of these guys maybe these guys show so well that they could trade one during training camp and and preseason and, and I, I think that maybe is a way they look maybe they tried to actually show off Stephen Ridley and see if they can maybe get that sixth or seventh round pick for him. Mm. I, I I'm with Nick here. I think it is going to be Anderson, Charles, Booker, and and Henderson. You know, all those guys have shined at different times. I think they really really like Booker when he gets healthy, and I can't see them waiting. You know, or trying to put him on pup if if they really think he's going to be a great player for him. And so if Ridley can show well, maybe that can get us an extra draft pick. You know, that's that's always the the dream. You know, is that you got such depth that everybody wants it, and so they trade for your player. Right. But uh, you know, really, I, I like the story. It's it's a great one to hear. Maybe this little bit of a comeback for for him, but he's gonna he's got a tough up road, uphill road to make this team. Yeah, and at the very least, no matter what happens with Stephen Ridley, he does have a reputation in the NFL, and not all of it is bad. And if he can put on tape what he's been showing the last few days at training camp during these preseason games, even if he doesn't make Denver's final roster and he ends up getting waived, NFL teams are always looking for experienced, uh, dynamic guys at running back. So there will probably end up being a place for him, but it will be interesting to see how the Broncos make that decision. But we're still obviously quite a, a, a few weeks out on that. Now, moving over to receiver, of course, we got Demarius Thomas, Emmanuel Sanders, Isaiah McKenzie, and Carlos Henderson as locks to make this team. Now, I know this is something you guys have have already talked about and you deep-dived on the receivers last week, so I just want to touch on this very quick. But it would seem that Benny Fowler is knocking on that lock door as well. So that makes five guys, and assuming they roster six, that leaves the one spot open to be fought over by the likes of Jordan Taylor and Cody Latimer and Marlon Brown and a few Futures guys and undrafted free agents. Now, again, I don't want to take too much time on this, but we'll start with you, Carl. With the Bears coming up, that last spot, who do you feel like really needs to show out on Thursday? Because as it stands right now, the coaches, from a special teams perspective, have been talking a lot about Cody Latimer. Even there, though, I think Cody Latimer is the guy that has to show well. He, The Broncos went out and got a ton of special teams help this last year. 
Uh, Carlos Henderson, he could be that gunner type. I, I think that they could actually use him that way because he's he's been struggling a little bit with the playbook. So they might not trust him very much early on. And he's going to make his impact there on special teams. So, you know, maybe if, if Carlos Henderson shows well, Cody Latimer becomes kind of thrown to the side a little bit. And, and so I think he needs to prove his worth. I think he needs to show, hey, you know, that second round pick, I bring value to this team. Because he does. He does actually bring value, but he's got to show even more. You know, this is his last chance to, to show that he can be uh, that, that great player that the Broncos envisioned with him. Nick, in your mind, do you think, I mean, Jordan Taylor had a lot of momentum coming out of the 2016 season, but at this point he really feels like kind of the odd man out. What's your take on Taylor fitting into this thing, and do you think his days in the orange and blue are pretty much behind him? Oh, I don't think that at all. I think there's still a very good chance that he makes this roster. In fact, out of those three, I think he is the most polished, or at least the highest upside boundary receiver, where a lot of these other guys are playing more slot and Taylor has the, the body type where he can be a red zone weapon. I mean, he showed it last year in a few games. Yeah. So I think he's battling with Marlon Brown to be more that backup Demarius Thomas type where you need that bigger, stronger outside guy. Uh, where I mean, Latimer can play that too, but he really hasn't shown that yet. So I, honestly, you know, like Carl was talking about earlier with having depth and guys maybe being traded, I could see Latimer being a guy that could be traded. You know, if somebody gets hurt or injured, yeah. they could hope that – you know, oh, just a seventh round conditional pick. You know, what's what's the harm there? You know, he still has that athletic upside of that second rounder. I could see him maybe if the Bears are struggling reuniting with John Fox, who mm-hmm. I believe originally picked him, picked him, or something like that. But I think Taylor definitely has a a path onto this team just because of the the skill set he brings. We don't have many other guys like him outside of Demarius Thomas. Good point, man. Good point. It will be interesting to see how uh, Cody Latimer performs in these preseason games because. I agree with you that as as great as his special teams acumen is, the Broncos need more from him than, than that. So these games will be key in figuring that out. Now, there's been next to no buzz about the Broncos' tight end so far in camp. A.J. Derby, um, he did receive some glowing words from Vance Joseph early on, but all has been quiet on the Western front since, really. Virgil Green, Jeff Hireman, Austin Trailer. They've all been getting a lot of work, though. I mean, they're on the field. They just haven't been too involved in the offense, and none of them are really making splash plays. Nick, how do you see this competition shaping up, knowing, of course, that Jake Butt is waiting in the wings to return at some point this season? I think that Hireman, from everything I've heard, has had a pretty solid camp, and he has the body type and athleticism where he could be a pretty good inline and receiving tight end. But he has to show that he can be healthy and, you know, stay out of the doghouse. Virgil Green, somebody who's, you know, always had athleticism but has developed more of an inline blocker and had some injury issues recently. So he may be on the chopping block if Austin Trailer and the young guys uh, do show out enough in preseason. Derby, you know, he's more of a move tight end and offline tight end. So I think, you know, he will get a chance, you know, flexing out, being more of that tight end too with the that McCoy likes to use when he uses those two tight end sets. But overall I feel like everyone is pretty similar in terms of the you know if they had a madden rating they'd all be like a 76 to, <laughs> to 80 right now right you know they're just there's not much there's not much separating them so camp is gonna camp and preseason is gonna really show uh, just better chemistry with the quarterback and understanding of the playbook so right now if i was guessing i think green and derby would be the starters but i think hireman you know i keep seeing him you know whether it be good or bad you know tight end he makes a uh a touchdown catch, and the next one he's dropping one in the end zone. So right. he's definitely a dark horse, and I could see him coming on and really challenging for that more in-line role as opposed to Virgil Green. Carl, when you guys did your deep dive episode on the tight ends, you re- your your take on Austin Trailer really kind of made me reevaluate this whole thing. Talk a little bit more about him and where you think he might fit in on this competition. Well, we, we had caught buzz – from, from a few people that are, are close to the Broncos that Austin Trailer was having a great offseason, you know, that, that OTA's minicamp. And I know there's not a whole lot of contact, but the coaches were liking what they were seeing. And, and when you hear that and you hear that he's kind of that great blocking tight end, it starts making you think that maybe he could be the new Virgil Green. And especially when you look at Virgil Green and his salary, you know, he, he has a decent cap hit. I mean, it's not – 
terrible, but it's it's still a decent cap hit, and every little bit can help to to save and and maybe add at other positions or save for next year. And and so for me, I think Virgil Green has to show that he's much better than Austin Trailer, not not equal, not just a little bit better. Has to actually show that he's vastly better to keep his roster position. I, I think Austin Trailer could really make life tough for him, and and Jeff Hireman too. You know, he's another one that he's shown decently as a blocker so far here at training camp. You know, he's gotten some buzz about that. And, and if he can show that he can be a little bit more consistent with his hands, you know, as Nick said, you know, he'll have a great touchdown catch, and then he drops the next easy one. And it's just, uh, it's infuriating. You right. know, you're, you're sitting there going, you want something from that tight end position, and we just haven't been getting it. So, yeah, it, it's an interesting group. I, I called it a while ago, maybe one of the best – camp battles that's going on right now because yep. i could see four different guys starting week one and and it wouldn't shock me one bit for any of them and of course then you have jake butt you don't even know where his health is yet you know he's been doing a few field drills and and things like that but you know i don't think he's i don't think he's going to make it for week one honestly i think they'll right. they'll hold him off on the pup and and see what he can do when he you know that six weeks in but yeah, it's an interesting battle and and preseason. I can't wait to see what these guys can do. Well, let's move over to the other side of the ball and focus on the trenches. Derek Wolf, Demata Pecco, I think at this point it's pretty safe to say are locks to start. I wasn't sure about Pecco for a while, had heard some things, but after more than a week of camp, I don't really doubt that anymore. Which leaves the right defensive end spot open and the backup spot. I mean, really, they're all open, but at the end of the day, I think we got to focus on that defensive end um, as as really the biggest starting job open on the defensive line. But let's focus first on nose tackle and the depth behind Pecco. How do you see that competition, Carl? Because you've got um, Zach Kerr, you've got Demata's nephew, or is it cousin? I get confused sometimes. Kyle um, and Tyreek Jarrett, the big fella out of pit, the undrafted rookie. I think Zach Kerr is a lock to make this team. I think the Broncos are pretty excited about what they've they've seen from him so far. And he's one of those guys that he has that versatility to play defensive end and nose tackle. So I, I could see him being that backup role to to Pecco and getting a lot of a lot of work. And then when they go into their big packages where they need that, you know, bigger guy at the defensive end position, that he would be the guy that gets on the field. So that, that's how I see the nose tackle position working out. And then Tyreek Jarrett maybe making the the practice squad. You know, there's been a lot of buzz about him being that one undrafted free agent that could really make this team. And I don't know. I I, I need to see it for myself, I guess, before I'm really willing to buy into that buzz. And Kyle Pecco, the problem is, yeah, he's on the PUP right now. You know, it's hard to win the position from True. from the, the ice tub, you know. And I, I think he has shown some promise. I think he has that – quickness that you you kind of like from that nose tackle position that but he's a little bit undersized for it as well so right now Zach Kerr is my guy to to take that spot Nick I want your thoughts on the defensive end spot opposite of Wolf and in that where does Billy Wynn fit in anywhere here I mean the Broncos brought him back you got Billy Wynn you got that guy that played in Oakland last year I forget his name or at least in the past Shelby Harris Shelby yep. Harris uh and the big fella Adam Gotsis and Jared Crick as well So I think that right now Jared Crick is the starter, but as Adam Gotsis gets farther and farther away from that knee scope and gets more and more reps, it sounds like he's going to take the starting five technique spot. And I would be the least bit surprised about that. OTAs, he was the guy that I kept giving, I kept getting, you know, more and more buzz from, you know, this Gotsis guy, man, he looks like a different player. You know, you had, I believe it was Vance Joseph said he looked like an action figure. And he's really put in the work, and I think that he is going to come on this year and be a solid contributor. He's still going to be – I believe he'll still have some issues technique-wise. You know, that doesn't just happen overnight. That's something that you need to see the field more and more to get that down. But in terms of the having the proper conditioning, uh, playing weight, muscle mass, I think that he's ready to take that next step and is really going to make a significant impact on the Broncos' run defense. But Billy Wynn, I mean, this guy, obviously, yeah. <laughs> you know, he he was brought in to, to bolster the depth at defensive end on the defensive line after the injury to Vance Walker last year, found a way to stick on the roster all year. You know, he wasn't great. He wasn't bad. He was kind of a steady force. But you saw that run defense take a huge step back, and that's not Billy Wynn's fault necessarily, but the Broncos liked him enough to bring him back in and give him another opportunity. 
when I watch him, he's he's a jag, right. just a guy. You know, he's a big body who knows this scheme and has the positional versatility to play some nose tackle as well as five technique and three and one technique and sub packages. But he's he's just not special enough strength wise, hand technique wise, burst wise that barring you know an injury, I don't see him making a team. You know, there's there's other guys that are like him out there that aren't very special. It's, you know, familiarity with Bill Collar and the, the Broncos defense. I think, you know, you need 90 guys right. for preseason, and I just don't see them keeping him when they whittle it down to 53 unless there is an injury and a spot opens up. But with, you know, adding Demarcus Walker, who's playing more outside linebacker, but I think in the end he's going to be a situational interior pass rusher just based on his college tape. And you have Goetzis and Crick, who's apparently bulked up and looking solid in camp. I think he'll probably be more of the rotational interior pass rushing type but i i think that wind does not have a spot if everything goes according to plan and everyone's healthy right i would agree with that well let's move on to outside linebacker guess who saw first team reps during the saturday scrimmage it was vontarius dora kasim Adabali was relegated to the second team by and large at least for that day here's what coach joseph had to say about why that particular change was made and why dora was given the opportunity we're trying to find the best guy to play opposite of uh, opposite of a uh, of Vaughn, you know, you know, week one maybe, you know, uh, a week one starter. So yeah, you know, who's who's the best player opposite of Vaughn? We don't know yet. You know, they're competing. Um, Walker's had some good days. You know, obviously uh, Doris had. I mean, he's had two good days. Yesterday was really good for him, and today was 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 physical and tough. So, you know, had a body's in that mix also. I seen. All right, so Dora has slimmed down. As a guy who spent all his collegiate days with his hand in the dirt, he now has a year at outside linebacker under his belt. <clears throat> you know, he's looking more uh, svelte as well. I mean, he's he's. It seems like he's shaped his body in a way that he can be more. Uh, he can be quicker in space and easier to react and all that. Nick, we've got Edibali, we've got Ken Ekenem, Dion Hollins, and as you mentioned, Demarcus Walker, all vying for a spot on the roster. And Walker has been, against all odds. Impressing people at outside linebacker. In fact, even Derek Wolf said, uh, I believe it was Saturday after the scrimmage, that he thinks Edge suits Demarcus Walker better than D line. Who do you expect to see good things from on Thursday night? Well, I think that he just still doesn't look like a twitched up edge rusher type to me, based on his college tape. And he looked somewhat maxed out in terms of his frame, playing at about 280, 285. So maybe he slims down and you know shows more explosion on the edge, but. Just based on I, – I really try to keep my opinions based on the tape. And he just does not look like a prototypical stand-up, you know, two-point edge rusher in the 3-4 defense. You know, maybe they have him at edge as a, more of a three-point stance, seven technique in the sub packages. But I think – I mean, you got to hope that Shane Ray and Shaq Barrett come back somewhat healthy this year, at least one of them, and is impactful because behind those guys, I see a pretty steep drop in terms of talent, you know, you have some hope with Edibali, but apparently he's been somewhat up and down in camp. And this shows also with Dora getting starting reps. Dora did show well against the bears last year in the first preseason game. Granted the bears offensive tackle situation was one of the worst in football, but most of those, most of those sacks I've gone back and revisited the film on that game, Nick. And it seemed like both those sacks Dora got were, were coverage sacks because the quarterback yeah. had to bring the ball back down and starts kind of drifting, and then boom, the hit from Dora. Not necessarily a guy blowing off or blowing up his assignment one on one to get to the quarterback. Yeah, I don't. I'm not expecting huge things from Dora, even though he has slimmed down. You know, he's not going to probably be a super impact player. You know, if he can develop and do an edge rusher number four, or edge rusher number three this year, depending on injuries, you know, that's valuable for an undrafted guy. You know, there's you got to fill out that roster, and you you need depth at those positions, especially edge rusher, but. Overall, I'm feeling a little bit nervous about the depth at edge rusher if, for some reason, Ray or Barrett don't come back week one, week two, yeah, near 100%. I would agree with that as well. I have some misgivings. Carl, what's your take on this thing? I still think, from the, from the sound of things, it, it doesn't look like Shane Ray or Shaq Barrett will be 100% week one. And so for me, I, I think Edibali will still win that position for that week one start opposite of Von Miller. And I, I think he has a decent skill set. I don't think he's anything great. I don't think he has anything that really shines through. I think he's just decent at everything. He's a decent hand fighter. He has a decent first step. 
he does a decent job anchoring when when he's asked to. You know, I I, I put on Twitter what this guy could do, and I saw him play nose tackle for New Orleans. You know, this outside linebacker that weighs like 250 pounds that he's playing nose tackle. And he actually got some amazing push on the interior. Yep. And so I, I think he has a decent skill set and we can at least hold up that first week long enough. You know, uh, it, it's not ideal, but it's it's what you got to do when injuries start showing up. And, you know, in football, it's always it's not a matter of if injuries happen. It's always a matter of when. And, you know, at least we get those players back. That's the that's the night. You know, I'm, you know, especially our week one opponent was San Diego. You know, they've lost their first two picks in the draft. Yep. Man. You know, most likely just, for they, the season. That's every year. They can't catch a break, that team. I, I don't know. It's hard. It's it's one of those I feel bad for them, but at the same time, it's, you know, they're a rival. So <laughs> how bad can you feel for them? Right, right. So, yeah, no, I, I think Edibali can show up there. And, and then we have a couple other guys. And I'm with you. Dora, I don't think he's as hyped up as some people made him last preseason. I'm. I think he really fell into the right place at the right time. Yep. Being chased from the other side and almost fell right into Dora. <laughs> so he, he he's a decent player, but I don't think he's going to be anything ever special. Well, we'll see if uh, you know a year in the system and some losing some lbs and all that can allow him to take a step forward in year two, kind of like we saw from Shaq Barrett uh, in his early career. You know, when I looked at Edibali, the two things that really jumped out to me, and I'm I'm no I'm not a scout. That's that's not my forte. But what really jumped out to me about him was a decent get off, and he's a motor guy. He's a guy that's always going to give you 100% effort on each and every snap. So at least if it comes down to him starting opposite of Von Miller for a week or two, the Broncos have that. Now let's jump over real quick. I want to move through these a little bit quicker because we're we're running out of time, and I want to get to the mailbag. Top three cornerback slots, obviously pretty locked in. But beyond Bradley Roby, it really has been a, a bit of a dogfight. Early on, Lorenzo Das has been one of the stars of camp. He's nabbed multiple interceptions. Seems like almost every day he gets an interception, always around the ball. Then you got the rookie third rounder, Brendan Langley. He's shown some good things. Uh, he's utilizing his length and his physicality to his advantage, which you want to see. Carl, do you see the Broncos carrying more than five corners? And if so is the depth chart pretty much already decided? Because in my opinion, I, I really don't see a place for Chris Lewis-Harris making this team, even though he's a Vance Joseph guy. I think they'll stick with five. Broncos are going to have a tough numbers crunch with that outside linebacker, maybe having to carry a couple extra guys early on in the season. So five cornerbacks, that's probably what they're going to have to stick with. Nick, are we actually going to see Lorenzo Doss translate some of this uh, training camp sizzle to production on the field, you think, this year? Oh man, I hope so. You know, the fan in me hopes so, but I haven't seen him on tape yet this year. So hard to say based on his college tape and his tape last year, he's just not really an athletic enough cornerback for the Broncos to play the scheme that they like to use. You know, they have those super hyper athletic technical cornerbacks that can play man to man for, you know, press man to man with little to zero help over the top. And that's something that I don't see with Doss. He's not explosive enough. Uh, in his steps or he's not fluid enough in his hips you know to backpedal with those guys and that type of scheme I always thought he would have been better more in a zone scheme where he can use his length his eyes and his aggressiveness to come down and attack the ball right rather than being a guy who you know trailer and trail uh, in man coverage in or out of the slot and so hopefully you know he translates this year but as cornerback four you know also, hopefully we don't see him that much. You know, we have the best <laughs> right. we have the best trio of cornerbacks in the NFL. I mean, honestly, if the Broncos keep up what they've done the last few years in terms of the secondary this year, we were talking about the best run of any secondary in NFL history, I think. That's how good they've been in the secondary. And hopefully we don't see Doss too much this year because I want to keep that run going. I'm pretty sure no defense has ever been the number one passing unit in the league three years in a row. So the Broncos can set and create some new history this year if they can stay on top of the hill like that. But, hey, let's move on to the actual Bears game on Thursday night. 
we've all been waiting for this, chomping at the bit, trying to uh, you know get some actual football that we can watch, we can measure, we can enjoy. And we're going to start with some matchups to watch. And it's kind of hard to talk about matchups because in the preseason anyway, you never know how much playing time guys are going to see. But that doesn't mean, at least on the Broncos' end, that there aren't some situations to monitor. And we've pinpointed a few, and we're going to break them down. And we'll start with Adam Gotzis. Now, he could be the answer to a lot of Denver's questions, but we're still yet to really see the player the Broncos envisioned when they spent that second-round pick on him last year. Now, on Thursday night, he is expected to see some snaps. I heard Coach Joseph talk about it. Uh, Nick, talk about why Gotsis going against the Bears' interior is a matchup that you in particular are going to be paying attention to. Well, if anybody followed my takes prior to the draft uh, two years ago, I was all aboard the Chris Jones hype train from Mississippi State. Uh, He had his knee scope, so he hasn't really been participating in the Chiefs camp. But I thought that with the Broncos losing Malik Jackson, if they were going to keep the defense elite, they were going to need another guy opposite of Derek Wolf because not only was Malik Jackson great as a pass rusher, but he was imperative in run defense. And with when Vance Walker got hurt last year, we immediately took a pretty big step back in relying on Jared Crick. Crick's a solid five technique, three technique type, but he just never really has had the mass or the strength to be anything more than a good rotational type. So with Gotsis, you know, healthy coming off that knee injury and the second year already being a raw player coming out of college, I'm really expecting him to take a step this year and challenge for that starting role and hopefully win it. And this is specifically important going against the Bears because with the Bears having the third worst record in football last year, you know, it's not the most talented roster. But one area they are super talented is the interior offensive line. You know, last year, fantasy football players, I'm sure, are aware that the Bears running back Jordan Howard had a great year. Right. Now, that's because he he is a really good running back. Don't get me wrong. But the Bears have one of the more unheralded interior offensive lines in football. Uh, From left to right, left guard, center, right guard, they have uh, Josh Sitton, the former uh, Green Bay Packer, who is one of the top 10 guards in the league. Cody Whitehair, who's coming in his second year, is one of the more athletic intelligent uh, offensive lineman in the draft class two years ago. And he looks like he's taking that center spot running. I mean, he may end up being one of the better centers in the NFL, especially with how they use him because he's just so technical and athletic. And then at right guard, they have uh, Jake Long, who, you know, the son of Howie Long and Kyle been Long. a very Kyle, Kyle Long. Long. I bet. Kyle Long. I apologize. <laughs> Jake Long's the defensive end. They have Kyle Long. I even have it written down here. Um, who's, you know, one of the better right guards in football. So Adam Gatsis is going to really have his his hands full in this game with those blockers because they are some of the the better, you know, interior trios in the NFL right now. And if Denver's defense is going to, you know, hopefully reach back up to that 2015 level or at least take a step that way, they have to improve that interior defensive line and stop the run better. And this will be very indicative if they're able to do that because the Bears' interior offensive lineman is very good. Well, next up... Well, next up, we're going to flip the script and focus on the Broncos' interior. Now, at this time, I'm not sure how much we're going to see from Ron Leary on Thursday night, considering he's been nursing a groin injury, but the Broncos will play Menelik Watson in Chicago, so we can probably expect to see at least a few snaps if he's healthy enough from Leary. Matt Paradis, I'd be surprised if he plays. So that leaves Connor McGovern uh, starting at center and Max Garcia in all likelihood at left guard. Now the Bears have Eddie Goldman and Akeem Hicks, and while we're not sure again how many snaps these guys are going to see, it is a matchup versus the Broncos interior that that bears monitoring, pardon the pun. Carl, why would this matchup be a litmus test in your mind worth worth measuring? Well, Eddie Goldman is a decent player. I mean, he was a high draft pick not too long ago, and Akeem Hicks, another very solid player. And and so this Broncos interior, they have to show that there's something different about this offensive line than years past. And and even if not everybody's going to play, like you said, Leary's maybe only going to play a few snaps. Matt Paradis probably not going to play. So maybe this isn't the actual group that's going to be starting. But at the same time, the ability to to see the depth of this unit, to be able to see that we actually have some backups that are quality starters, right. you know, of, of Connor McGovern, Max Garcia maybe, or you know, um, Billy Turner. Yeah, exactly. Those kind of guys, you know, that, that'd be huge for this team. We haven't had depth at the interior on the offensive line in general for a long, long time. And, and that's, that's something that's hard to do in the NFL today. And so, yeah, it'll be a great litmus test for them. 
and and to see if they can get any kind of push for the run game. You know, that's what I'm looking for. You know, I know pass blocking is important to keep our quarterback safe, but you know, last year that was the big issue was that third and one play mm. was probably our worst play on the entire team. Yeah. You know, that, that we just couldn't do anything. I anytime we had third and one, second and one, I just wanted to turn off the TV. <laughs> It was that bad. I mean, I, my, my wife can tell you how many times I screamed at the TV and probably scared my child. And, and you know, I, I probably scarred her for life with those third and one plays. <laughs> so, yeah, big test to see if they can get any kind of push. And I, I'm excited to, to see it. I mean, I've heard a lot of great things about this, this interior. Well, let's keep it uh, on the offensive line for one last matchup here with Garrett Bowles. I mean, this kid has looked like the truth so far, going against some very good edge rushers in Denver. Now, during the Saturday scrimmage, Colby told me nobody got past him. So this week, he's going to get Leonard Floyd. Nick, talk about why Bowles versus Floyd is a matchup you'll be scrutinizing. Yeah, Floyd was the number nine overall selection in the 2016 NFL draft by the Bears, and he is a very unique pass rusher. Normally, you don't see guys that have his height and length hold up at edge. You know, he's 6'6", with 33 and, a, and an eighth inch arm length. So very, very wiry and only 244 pounds. So wiry, but has tremendous burst and bend. So he makes up for that height with the ability to get low and drop that shoulder with some nice uh, ankle flexibility and the ability to turn the corner and get after the quarterback. And the Broncos don't really have an edge rusher with that kind of skill set. You know, we have Shane Ray and Shaq Barrett who aren't as tall and long. And even Von Miller just aren't that long, tall, uh, lanky type of edge rusher that can drop their shoulder. So I'm you're interested to see how Bowles does going up against a guy that, you know, is going to be able to stay off his pads pretty decently with the length that he has, along with just the athleticism that uh, Leonard Floyd brings. He's one of the better young emerging Uh, edge rushers in the NFL and if he you know can stay healthy uh, he's had some head issues some concussion issues so you never know about that but if he can stay healthy he's very talented and could end up being one of the the better edge rushers so very good test for Garrett Bowles early on Um, I'm not expecting Floyd to really give him much of an issue though on the ground game just because he is more of a a beanpole type there are rumors that he's up to 250 255 but still I think Bowles will handle him on the edge in terms of run blocking but in pass blocking sets, that's a that's a premium matchup. Two first round picks, very athletic guys. So that's definitely one that you need to watch because Garrett Bowles needs to hit for the Broncos to return to the playoffs and take a step forward in terms of just overall uh, talent on the roster. So this will be very indicative if he if he can hang there and with what consistent with what consistency he will be able to hang at left tackle this year. And I think it's safe to say he's going to get a lot of snaps because the Broncos, as impressed and as they've been with him so far, they still want to see him in action and get him plenty of reps leading up to uh, the regular season. Now, before we get out of here, let's take a quick question uh, from the Mile High Mailbag, maybe two. We are your football priests here to offer absolution and answers to your burning Broncos questions, and we always enjoy engaging with you, our listeners. Now, today's first question comes from Aquaman h 20 On Twitter, his question, fellas, is, who is the biggest pleasant surprise so far? Carl, your answer for Aquaman, the most pleasant surprise to you. Garrett Bowles. You know, he he came in with a lot of questions of how early could he make an impact for this team in a positive manner. And it just sounds like he is getting better with every practice to the point that there was one practice, I think he had three times going up against Von Miller, and Von Miller didn't get to the quarterback. You know, if you can stop Von Miller... You can stop any player in this league. Yep. I mean, that, that, that's just the, the flat out truth there. And, and so that's great that Von Miller has been doing a great job of helping him out and, and getting him excited about the position. But yeah, he's been my pleasant surprise because if he can be a great player year one, that goes a long way to this offense being great this year. Yeah. You know, not, not just even average, you know, having a great offensive line and, and being able to run the football, being able to protect the quarterback. Oh my goodness. It would change the entire. Yeah. viewpoint of this of this Broncos team if that offensive line could be something we saw what a good very good offensive line can do for a fair to middling team when the Broncos played the Tennessee Titans last year so that's the type of jump this team could take if the offensive line coalesces Nick who's been your biggest pleasant surprise so far I'm going to kind of go off the beating beaten path here and I'm going to go with Von Miller now hear me out 
Von Miller is somebody who's obviously always been a super high impact player on the Broncos, but he had some issues early on in his career uh, off the field, you know, had an injury as well. And then the team brought in Demarcus Ware, who completely, I think, might have changed the tra- trajectory of the Von Miller's career. You know, he still was going to be a talented guy, but bringing in Demarcus Ware really shaped him and showed him what it means to be a leader and what it means to be a just an elite player on defense. And you can see that with Demarcus Ware gone, Von Miller has really stepped up and taken over that leadership role. You know, whether it be talking with Demarcus Walker, uh, Garrett Bowles, um, calling things of the defensive line. I mean, he's really stepped up and showing, uh, taking a lot of these young guys under his wing. Yeah. And so I think that just as a leader and just as a face of the franchise, you know, he's paid like it, but he's really showing it this year in terms of just being the guy. You know, if there's anything that's going on, the team's going to look towards him to see where he, to see what he has to say and to see what he does. And also, apparently, he looks better than he ever has in camp as well. I mean, you know, he's one of the best defensive players I've ever seen in my life. And they're faster, stronger, and is dominating guys even more than he normally has from what I've heard at camp. So you, everybody knows that he's good. You know, they've seen him for years doing well in camp and in games. But the, a lot of people have made it a point that he looks even better this year. You know, his quads are as big as they've ever seen. So yep. he's... I'm really looking for Von Miller. I don't think he's going to get 30 sacks. You know, this whole talk <laughs> this week about the 30 sacks. I mean, yeah. my goodness, that would be incredible. But I think, you know, over 15 sacks and just uh, uptake and pressure and a better defensive stops as well. I think Von Miller might take his game to the next level, not only as a leader, but also on the field. So I'm, I'm super stoked about him this year. Interesting angle. Did, Go ahead, Carl. Did anybody see that they, uh, they gave him a whistle at practice? Yeah. You know, he had his veteran, veteran day off, and they gave him a whistle to be a coach out there. Uh, yeah, and I guess he was just blowing it at random times. So I wonder if they took the whistle away from him. But, <laughs> yeah, I, I agree. I think that's great to see that he's really stepped into that leadership position because we have lost a lot of leadership. You know, Peyton Manning, DeMarcus Ware, I think that's been one of the biggest things that isn't talked about with this Broncos team is just the loss in leadership. Definitely. And so Von Miller can be that guy that everybody looks to. And, and really steps into that position, that would be great to see. For me, it would be Connor McGovern. It would be the biggest pleasant surprise so far. He's a player I've always believed in ever since the Broncos took him in the fifth round last year, but then didn't suit him for a single snap or single game, and he didn't see a single snap as a rookie. So it's really gratifying to see him come along and in this switch to the power scheme, really set himself apart. I mean, the Broncos have, if if he continues on this trajectory, it looks like the Broncos are going to have – a very, very solid uh, backup center, and a very, very solid swing guard. And if anything happens to Matt Paradis, I mean, there's no guarantee with those hips that he's going to return to the Ironman form he displayed over the last two years. It's good to know Connor McGovern is there waiting in the wings. Now, one last question, then we're out of here. It comes from Alice Dare Curry at XY and ZCOUK on Twitter. His question, fellas, is... Does it help or hinder the offense going up against the no-fly zone? Iron sharpens iron, but surely it can have a negative impact on confidence. Now, this is an issue that um, I've written about lately. Will and I have talked about it, but Nick, let's start with you. Your answer for uh, Alistair. Well, I I agree completely. It's a double-edged sword. You know, it could go either way. It depends on the quarterback and who they are as a person and as a leader. You know, you got to have that short-term memory when you're playing quarterback like they say about relief pitchers if you give up that home run you know you got to go out and pitch that next pitch and so far it sounds like Paxton may be having some uh, confidence issues just based on stuff I've heard from the media and some team sources as well so that's something that's big but that said you know you the cream has to rise to the top so if you're you know if the great no-fly zone is making you lose your confidence and you're getting worse and worse when the when the game's being played on Sundays, I mean, I know the no-fly zone is better, but we're talking practice compared to the game. So it's going to be hard in the games as well. So I don't feel uh, too bad <laughs> for the quarterback. It could have a negative impact on their confidence. But if you're going to be an NFL quarterback, you got to have thick skin and you got to go out there and compete. So no-fly zone, Bears secondary coming up in a week, it doesn't matter. you got to go out there and play. What do you think, Carl? Do you think this is the, the refiner's fire that can allow, whether it's Trevor Simeon or Paxton Lynch, to really take their game to the next level, or do you think this is something holding them back? I think it's something that can be a, a great positive for them. You know, I, I do think that the quarterbacks maybe need, need to do a better job of communicating with the no-fly zone of, hey, this is what I'm seeing, what are you seeing when I'm looking this way, and, and maybe pick their brain a little bit to 
you know, as Von Miller tried to show, you know, Garrett Bowles, hey, when I line up like this, this is what I'm trying to do. And, you know, try to help him just to see what he needs to be able to see. Uh, to me, probably the the bigger knock to confidence for these quarterbacks is just the switching like every five plays. You know, I, I, that's the problem with having this quarterback competition to me is, you know, for the for the scrimmage. You know, they had six plays with the first string, six plays with the second string. And it, it's hard to build any kind of consistency with your offensive line. You know, when they're having to work on different kind of cadences with the two quarterbacks, they're having to work on, yeah. you know, their communication with with every player there. To me, that's a bigger knock than going up against the no fly zone. You know, that, that's a great challenge for these quarterbacks to have to go against them. And, and like I said, I think they need to be working to pick at their brains a little bit more to understand, you know, maybe how they can improve, what they can do to kind of fake them out a little bit more. That's a good point, man. And it is, you know, one thing that has really stood out to me since camp started and you know it bleeds through when these guys take to the podium after practice is how intense the competition is between the defense and offense and how much pride in particular both units take when they get one on the other in fact uh, I believe it was Saturday's practice no it was Friday's practice actually Um, you know CJ Anderson came out and they asked him you know who's winning in the run game is it the offense or is it the defense And CJ said, well, I think it's the offense. And then Derek Wolf came in and said, oh, no, 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 it's the defense. Darian Stewart came in and said, oh, no, 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 it's the defense. And it it just goes to show you how ultra competitive these two units are. And I have to question at a certain point, you know, how far do you take that? Because this is an offense that is still trying to find their way. And I don't say that in the sense that the defense needs to pump the brakes and take it easy on them by any stretch. But as you say, Carl, I think it would be great and I would hope that they can communicate better and help each other out, and especially these two young quarterbacks who are trying to find their uh, their way in the league and, and figure out how to be more productive as starters. So anyway, that's all the time we have for today's show. We ran a little bit long. Uh, again, big thanks to Colby for joining us. Follow the show on Twitter, at HuddleUpPod. You can find Nick in the Twitterverse, at Nick Kendall, MHH, Carl, at Carl Dumbler, MHH, and myself, at Chad and Jensen. Uh, Tweet us your questions. We'll always try to address your concerns on the show as often as we can. And don't forget to subscribe, y'all. For Nick and Carl, I'm Chad. We'll talk to you soon. Mile high huddle.